I would like for you guys to just do a little sociology project with me. So close your eyes. I'm going to paint a picture with my words, and I want you to picture it in your mind. So once your eyes are closed, I'll paint the picture. You guys are looking at me. I know they're not closed. So picture in your mind the cutest puppy picture you've ever seen in your life. All right, let's go to that first picture. Does it match? No, because that's the cutest pic puppy picture in the world right there. <clears throat> that was one of the first days we got him. He still has that. It used to be a duck on a rope. Now it's just a rope. Um, all right, so close your eyes again. I want you to picture in your mind the perfect warrior to defeat the demon thing. What is it, a Zool? Zool from Ghostbusters. All right, now open your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> the warrior has been chosen. All right, one more. Let's go, a couple more. Picture in your mind the meanest, hardest, toughest cop in the entire country of the Philippines. All right. Did you get it? Yeah. That is literally one of the most notorious police officers in all of the Philippines. Ask him how old he is. He'll say he's somewhere between 12 and 60. All right. A couple more. Close your eyes. Picture two red pandas squaring off, getting ready to fight over a girl. Got it? All right. This is literally what they do before they fight. It is the most adorable thing in the world. All right, three more. One, this is a generational thing. I would like for you to close your eyes and picture who's on first. Who's on first? Go ahead. Who is? All right. Now, this one's important, so you want to close your eyes and really picture this. I want you to picture a couple that is married and they are going to be forever. They have been for a while and you just know they are going to be together forever. Got that picture in your mind? All right, let's have a look. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You guys got my uh, Easter bunny doing inappropriate things. You know. Go to the next one because I messed that one up. Okay, there it is. There's a couple. We, we, uh, we scarred a bunch of kids permanently that Easter. Um, that is a couple that is going to be together forever. Uh, ducks have always been a kind of a cool animal to me, and Crystal and I had this duck couple that turned into a duck family, and they were, we lived with them at the bottom of our stairs for like seven years, and that's a picture of them. So, now close your eyes for the last one. Now I want you to picture a couple that is on a long journey, and the husband has decided to drive without a map. And so the long journey has become an extra long journey. And now I want you to picture the wife telling the husband just how dumb he is for not using a map. And I want you to picture the husband's reaction. You guys, I got that one? All right, let's see it. There it is. Moving on. There are so many things in these pictures that you can't see right? I have this amazing picture of Crystal that I, that I keep with me all the time. I've got different variations of it. Anytime I traveled, I made sure I had it. It was before cell phones. Now it's on my cell phone. I've got a picture of my daughter and my family. I have these pictures that mean a lot to me because they are a reminder to me of what I have at home when I'm not at home. And they're a reminder to me of why I do the things that I do and I live the life that I live and I work the work that I do. These are constant reminders for me. And I, I love pictures. I'm not one of those guys that takes a picture of everything because I honestly, my firm opinion is, is pictures are hurting our ability to enjoy the times that we're enjoying because we're too busy taking pictures of the times that we're enjoying. And so our picture taking, look, we, we struggle through deciphering scrolls that we've had to put together like jigsaw puzzles and translate through three or four languages to get the Bible that we read. Nobody is going to have a problem understanding our generation and our time of existing because we document everything so well, right? Like the whole taking pictures of your food at a restaurant, I, know, I still won't understand that, but people will know, hey, Americans used to eat fried chicken and mashed potato sandwiches using waffle as the bread, right? We, people are going to know that, that we ate like that at one point. 
But there's so much more to these stories, right? So what we were actually, that, that picture, the last picture of the, the duck walking, the male duck walking away from the nagging female duck, or you, we can reverse it. Look, men nag, I don't want to be, you know, we can reverse it. But what was actually happening was is another male duck had flown into the area, and so it was on. And that male duck was chasing off that other male duck because nobody messes with his woman. And it was kind of cool, you know, we didn't have cell phone videos back then, but that was actually taken on a digital camera that's not attached to my cell phone. I know that some of you don't know that that was a thing. Um, but we, we look at these pictures and we kind of miss so many things. And there are so many um, unseen things that all we can hope for is to catch a shadow of what they actually are. The reason why I've called this pictures and used this picture analogy is because we've, we've been walking through the book of Hebrews, and there's this interesting theme about Hebrews. Chapters 1 through 4 are kind of interesting. Chapter 5, 6, and 7, they repeat themselves a lot. We heard a lot for a long time about Melchizedek. We all know how to pronounce that name correctly now because it got beaten up in here. But we learned why it was important to understand that Jesus is in the line of priests from Melchizedek and not from the, the Aaron priestly lineage of just birth. We, we learned a lot about that. We also learned that Jesus is an anchor, not a rescuer. He's, he's not going to remove us from our situations. That's not to say that he can't because he's God. We don't tell God what he can and can't do. But, but Jesus' own words tells us that he's going to be an anchor for us. And, and then we get into chapters 8, 9, and 10, and we start to get the same repetition on a different topic. So at our job as, as preachers and pastors and exegetical people who try and, and discern and, and reveal what, what the scriptures are telling us, we have to understand that there's a repetitiveness for a reason. And so if you'll open your Bibles with me to chapter 10 of Hebrews. This is just happening today. So up until this point, up until chapter 10, so in, in chapters 8 and 9, the author has used a very repetitive description to explain what he's trying to get across. Up until this point, there are 11 mentions in just two chapters of symbols or pictures or things that represent something but aren't the actual thing. And so we'll start with number 12, starting with verse 1 of chapter 10. Before we do that, will you just bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just... We welcome you into this place today. And Lord, we, we love so much how you use the broken vessels in this world to share the message of your kingdom, to share the message of, of worship, to share the message of, of the sacraments of communion, and, and we just use the broken vessels that, that we are to do that. So, Lord, I just pray that you envelop the shattered vessels that are in this room today and that your Holy Spirit works as the glue that puts us back together so that we can understand and know and love and cherish and accept you for who you really are, not just who we think you are. In your son's precious name, amen. All right, so... 11 times. So if we look at, at verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. Okay, so... We've heard this the past couple of weeks. This is the argument, right? Um, the old system, the, the cult of personality that was the tabernacle system of constantly atoning for your daily sins by sacrificing animals, by using a priest as a mediator, by keeping that temple open 24-7. This system is the system that was in place, and, and Jesus is on the scene to say, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't work. 
right? And if we just use the basic morality 101 test gauge, which is the Ten Commandments, we can see that they are incredibly simple. They are incredibly easy to understand. We teach them to the smallest children in Sunday school. Kids in the preschool classes start learning about the Ten Commandments. That's how simple they are to teach and to understand and to, to go through them. I, I mean, it's, it's really simple. There's only one God. You're not supposed to worship any false idols. That makes total sense. Uh, don't use God's name in vain. And no, that doesn't mean what you think it means. It means don't use God's name to expand your opinion and agenda. Don't use God's God as a leverage weight. Uh, mom and dad are cool. Uh, don't kill people. Don't cheat on your spouse. Don't steal anything. Don't give a false understanding of God to your people or your squad or your friends. And don't want your neighbor's husband or wife when you have a perfectly good one at home, okay? Um, these make elemental sense. And so we have this morality 101 that kind of sets us up, but they're not complex, but here's the most important part. They're impossible to perfect. They are both simple and impossible. And when God gave them, he knew, he knew that people would do exactly what they did, which was try and turn it into something that they can use to better themselves, absent God. So that's where we're at. And that's exactly what happened. You, you see this, this never-ending rotation, this get-out-of-jail-free card, this, this confessional repentance moment where I did this bad thing, but I breed rabbits for a living, so I'm just going to go grab one, I'm going to be honest about it, and I'm going to, you know, get rid of it. The problem with it is, is it did not remove the entire stain of guilt and shame. It was specific to the thing that you confess to the priest, just like confession today in Catholicism. It doesn't work because how many serial killers do you know that go and confess to their priest every time they kill someone? It doesn't work because the things that we keep inside of us because we want to hang on to them or we're too ashamed or we don't understand what's actually going on, those things stay in. We're not going to sacrifice a bull for doing something that we're so incredibly ashamed of that we're not going to mention it to another soul. Those sins go unnoticed. Those things go unnoticed. The heart of man is broken and twisted. We talked about it last year when we talked about this rending, when we rend our heart and we wring out all the sin and nonsense and we allow God to start purifying our lives and our hearts, then we start to understand that this sacrificial system of dealing with a sin at a time is never going to do anything because we are all born broken and fallen short of the mercy of God. Grace is necessary because we can't obtain it on our own. This system was designed to start understanding that the atonement for sin and, and the understanding of, of communicating in relationship with God, this was a foundation layer, right? So we have an app. This is app version 1.0. Within a week, we're going to have version 1.5 out because we had to put the bare bones on because Apple is incredibly difficult to deal with. But now that we got it in, we can start updating it, right? So this is, this is version 1. And you, if you read your Bible and you read your scriptures, every time there is a covenant moment with God and with people, we get an update. We get a revision, right? And we can understand that in our technical world. We can understand that, hey, this thing's glitchy. This thing's got issues. Or, you know what? Television is no longer 480p. It is now 4K. And your 480p tube television isn't going to be able to broadcast in 4K. We understand those things technically. Or Apple brings out a new phone every year. My first Apple phone was $199. Last year's phone was $1299. Right? So we, we grasp that, and we don't hesitate, right? Just not, I bet you there's not anybody in here who doesn't have a smartphone. We understand that. So this tabernacle system, this cult of self-esteem, it's not working. So let's move on to verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered, for the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. I'm going to keep going. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So, here's, I mentioned this last week. What this is saying is Jesus, God, saying, I don't want your bull anymore. And he's literally talking about a bull. He's saying, I don't want your bull anymore. Let your bull go have a little fun with that 
that sexy heifer over there in the shade and you can have more bulls and more cows. Just, I don't want it anymore. I want you. Don't you understand? This was never about the animal. This was never about the sacrifice. This was never about the laws or the rules or the process. This was never about the tabernacle. It was never about any of those things. It was about you and me and, and us being in relationship with one another. But, but we can't have that relationship because you're not reconciled because of the sinful life that you lead. God is the holiest of holies. In order for us to be in relationship with him, we have to at least be pursuing holiness. Understand that word there. It's important. Pursuing holiness. Pursuing is important because it means that we don't have to be perfect before we know him. But that's the, the imagery and the, and the attitude that was created by the tabernacle system. We thought that we could make ourselves good enough for God. And he's saying, I don't want those sacrifices anymore. Let's keep going. Hebrews 5, 10, 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire. You were not pleased with them. Though they were offered in accordance with the law, then he said, here I am, I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. Jesus comes to say, I'm not getting rid of the sacrificial atoning system. I'm just changing it. I'm updating it. I'm upgrading it. We're not going to create this never-ending cycle of the cult of self-esteem. Instead, one sacrifice holy and pure in the eyes of the Lord to cover all sins for all time, forever and ever. Because in that way, I get you. I don't get your ritualistic offerings that you do because that's what you're supposed to do when you do a bad thing. I don't want to improve your self-esteem. I want to know you. And I want you to know me. Jesus lays out the new covenant once and for all. And he comes to say, I'm, I'm going to remove sin, root and stem, all sin for all time. Which happened, verse 10 is super cool. That's why I left it by itself. And by that, by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So some of your Bibles, some of the translations will, be, will say, we have been made, we have been sanctified. And sanctified is this really fancy word that means put in its right place, made right, okay? Our, our world is broken. We are born broken. We are born with the sin of the original fall in our lives, and we can't escape that, which is why the cross is so important. And then we come to this moment where he says just so clearly that I don't want you to just know who I am. I want you to be made right, and sanctified is one of those fancy Bible church words. Sanctified, my favorite use of the word sanctified is, is if you've ever been to or seen a traditional Jewish wedding ceremony, there's a moment in the ceremony where it's called the Kedushin. And the Kedushin is a very important moment because the vows that are exchanged are, in my opinion, the vows that need to be in every single wedding ever where the groom and the bride say to one another, God has sanctified you to me. God has, God has made us right. This is right. And sanctified in the church is a fancy word for surrendering your entire life to God and allowing the work of that grace to work in my life. Think of it as cleaning a house or a space with multiple rooms. You cannot clean that whole space by itself. You have to do it room by room. So when God gets in and we start walking down this sanctifying path with God, what we're doing is we're cleaning up our house a room at a time. We're allowing Jesus to get into the places that we keep the door shut when company comes over because we don't want anybody seeing what's behind that door. He comes in and root and stem cleans every house in our life. 
cleans every room in the house. This is, this is a cool one, right? So this is where it gets good. Hmm. Okay. We're going to speed it up a little here. Verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice which can never take away his sin. To sit down meant the work was done. The priest could never sit down because the work they were doing could never be completed. They were not allowed to sit until their work was done. You think about that for a moment. God, in all of his infinite wisdom and direction on everything about the tabernacle, which, by the way, was given in specific detail how to build in Scripture, he knew. And the priests weren't allowed to sit down because he knew the work could not be completed. Move on to 11. 11, it says, or 12, sorry. But when this, when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. The work was done. It is finished. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. So Jesus is saying, instead of you having to come every Sunday and, or every time you mess up to, to sacrifice an animal, instead I'm going to put that on your hearts and minds. As you get to know me, as we walk through this sanctifying work, it's just, it's going to happen. You don't have to put the effort into this because, because you know me, because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to envelop your life, it's going to happen. It, we, we try so hard to grab the reins and control it, and a lot of times what we're doing is, is we're taking the picture of the truth and we're hanging on to the picture instead of the real thing. Because the tabernacle was just a shadow, it was just a photograph, it was just an image of what the grace of God looks like. It wasn't the grace of God, it wasn't the ultimate atoning sacrifice. The work was never done. The priests could never sit down. When Jesus took the cross and died and was resurrected three days later, spent 40 days preparing people for him, he ascended to heaven on the day of Pentecost and the first thing he did was take a seat. We have got to not hang on to the pictures. So today, as I read this last verse, because it is amazing, I want us to think about the ability that we have today to celebrate another picture. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. I don't want your bull. God is saying, I don't want your bull. And, and here's the thing. Here, here's, here's, the, here's the scariest part about this, right? Because he's talking about offerings. And, and instead of donating livestock and spice and stuff like that, we give generously of our resources and of our money. And so what God's saying is, I don't need your offering. In my mind, when I look at the budget, I say, yes, we do. But that misses the heart of the matter. Once and for all, it is finished. You cannot sacrifice enough things of your own to God to get you the bigger mansion on the street of gold. You just can't. Because all he desires is you. Jesus didn't die today, today, but his death is a picture. It's a symbol. It's a shadow of his death. No picture can capture the reality. And since a picture might be all that you know, you just feel like it's impossible to, to let things go. And despite that fact, we, just like the Hebrews, keep coming back and making the same sacrifices week after week with no real change. 
And we may learn to like the picture, but love the form. And we may even celebrate that we are children of weakness and brokenness, brokenness, and that we have him. But I don't want anybody hanging on to a shadow of the truth. Because only the truth is real. And the truth is that God loved us so much that he sent his only son to live a perfect life and die for us, come back to life, and ascend to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God because it's finished. When we hang on to the picture, we hang on to the incomplete work. And that's something that doesn't exist because we can't uncomplete the work of Jesus Christ. We pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so blessed to just be in your presence today, Lord. And I pray that as we go out into the world today that we are grasping, holding tight, being anchored to the truth and the reality of who you are and what you did to us, for us. Not what we can do to find your favor. Thank you for that truth. Thank you for giving us a way when the way that we've chosen to go is a way that will lead to nowhere. Because God knows we'd go nowhere. Thank you for that truth. I thank you for every soul that is in this place. I pray a blessing on their lives, Lord. Just be with them. Lord, I pray for the world. I pray for our country. I pray for our city. But more importantly, Lord, I pray for your kingdom to be known and glorified in all we do and say. In your son's name, amen.